Okay. Um, let's go to Nehemiah. Probably one more time, and that'll be it for tonight. We'll see. I would think so. This morning we did a... I tried to show the ways of Tobiah. And Sanballat was in there. I think his name was Shemaniah, Shemaiah, the, uh, the trader that was hired to get in there. And other than just looking at it from the standpoint of a Christian trying to do some things in their life, uh, it was more of an approach to, for our kids or children out there as they hear their parents who are trying to do something right and the hassle that the kids are going to get from their friends and uh, family and that type of a thing. More along that line than uh, just, again, just studying the ways of the, the, the enemy out there because we already kind of know those. We've talked about it before. So I thought, well, we'll do, we'll do Tobiah in the morning. And then we'll do Nehemiah at night. And Nehemiah, how did Nehemiah handle all those challenges that came his way? Well, we have to remember that the enemy is still the enemy. And the way he worked in the Old Testament, he'll, he'll just work that way today. So we know that's not a problem. We don't have to really rightly divide that thing. Paul had some good verses in there that reminded us of, the, of, of those folks, uh, 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 evil seducers, and, and, and they're all out there. But to look at the ways of Nehemiah can be done, it can be very dangerous because Nehemiah is still an Old Testament answer. Nehemiah is still the kingdom of heaven as such. I mean, it's an earthly, physical response to an earthly, physical enemy. And we're looking at Paul, seeing Paul doesn't work that way. That's, that's one of the conflicts that I think uh, teaching Paul only type of a concept is hard for some folks. I know a pastor is no longer pastoring right now, and I wish he would. I wish he still was, but all he could ever do was go back to the Old Testament and find examples of how to be what the Christian should be based on an Old Testament end sample. And that's there's there's it's okay, but we have to remember. We'll see this here tonight because we're going to try to look at Nehemiah and Paul because it's different. Yet and yet Nehemiah responded to the enemy. Uh, so would Paul. And so we should respond to what they're trying to do to us, but the response is just, is just a little bit different than, than uh, what we would expect. So if I were to go back to the Old Testament and teach the ways of Nehemiah, we would suddenly be doing Old Testament teaching and could get ourselves in some physical challenges, which, which we ought not do necessarily. So if we look at, again, Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 3 this time, this again is where Nehemiah is told that there's a problem. And they said unto me, The remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Now we know this is a physical city, wall. This is what's taking place. But we see from, we see from Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, let's look there, and we'll see that Paul isn't so much worried about, well, he's not worried about the physical, you know, the buildings, that type of a thing. He's concerned about the person. And he's, he's very concerned because he, real, he has a concern. And his concern is the fact that we will be, or somebody will be, or we all will be, will be uh, deceived. And he says in verse 3, But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Then he talks about uh, preaching another Jesus and receiving another spirit and, uh, and uh, through another gospel type of a thing. So we know that Paul is concerned along those lines. Uh, we won't look at all the verses. It would take us again too long. But you know, Paul is concerned that, that people didn't have, he talks to people that they didn't have any joy. I mean, bondage is a rough thing. And, and he was concerned about that. If you look at, uh, look at 2 Timothy chapter 2. So we're still going to look at how Nehemiah dealt with Tobiah. But let's not get so caught up that we don't remember what it is that Paul himself says to us in these same situations. Ch second, second, Timothy, second Timothy, Second Timothy, chapter two, uh, verse twenty. See, Paul recognizes that he says here in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth. So he recognizes that that will exist. I mean, that is the way it was. And you know, in reality, that's what Nehemiah had, is he had some honored people in there, and he had, some, he had some snakes and some snakes in there. And he had some snitches, and he had some good people. And, he, and Paul says, listen, and in in he says, If a man therefore purge himself from these, who's that? That's the wood and of earth, and, some to, and to dishonor. 
If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use. And there are still things in our life that, that uh, uh, we realize that Paul, would, the Lord would have us get out of our lives. So Paul realized that there's something bad going on here. Remember he talks also, I think it's in 2 Timothy, uh, 1 Timothy 4, he talks about uh, seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Uh, he, he, he warns about that sort of a thing. Um, and then I think it's in Timothy, 2 Timothy 3, I think it's in, uh, yeah, there is verse 12, or 13. Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. So he knows what's going on, deceiving and being deceived. So both Paul and Nehemiah realize there's some horrible things taking place. So now, let's go back to, keep your fingers in Nehemiah all night here, but go back to Nehemiah, again, chapter 1 there. And we see in verse 4 that uh, it says here, and, and it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Well, we, we, we see that Paul is concerned because he had tears. He had tears, not a problem. And, and mourning certain days didn't have to do that. In fact, we even still have today that they have what they call mourners out in, that, in the Middle East and the Eastern, all that. All, they have mourners. They hire them to go and wail and cry, and, and they, they get paid for that. Well, you know that the news media is going to find that bunch. You know, so... Um, and boy, they really get into it. They must make pretty good money doing it because they really whale and, and uh, really, really have a hard time with that stuff. And then we don't see anything that Paul mentions in, 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 his, in his stuff about fasting. Now, there's, I'm not going to say that fasting isn't good on a physical med medical thing. We can talk about it someday, but um, this had to take place in these days. And we say, and it prayed before the God of heaven. Well, what does Paul say about prayer? Do we wait till the, the horrible situation comes? He says to pray without ceasing. So can, can you see what we're looking at here? We're looking at how Nehemiah handled He handled it the way he was supposed to. And he, and he got close to God, and he did what he needed to do. And we have to realize when these things come to us, we have things that we need to deal with as well. Do you remember the, uh, the pattern? Because I didn't. I had to find my old notes out here. I couldn't get it all out of there. And uh, we added that thing. Remember, we had grace and truth and mercy. I'm going to change that again as I learn these things. Uh, we see that one of the first things uh, Nehemiah ever did was pray. First thing, he just pray. So uh, we realize when we see something wrong in our lives or, or being challenged by somebody or something or, or life takes the knocks that it's going to be thrown at us here pretty soon, prayer and tears right off the bat. We just go right straight to God. We're always with God. And then we have grace, truth, mercy. We'll get into that stuff a little bit later. So we see that Paul's resp or Nehemiah's response was prayer. Look at verse 5. Nehemiah 1, verse 5, and said, and here's what he prays. Now, um, there's a fear of God. That's an Old Testament fear of God. And yes, God is to be feared. God is still God. But to a saved person, one of his children, there ought not be that kind of a fear there. Our children ought not be fearing Dad. They should respect and fear Dad in the respect that, yes, he could, he could thunk on you any time he wanted. He's Dad, but you don't bring your children up under that kind of a fear and, and burden and belittling because when they get their first opportunity, they're gone. We can, we can drive, we can make them angry. Paul warns about that. Um, but you know, it, but one of the things that Paul, one of the things that Nehemiah mentions there is uh, in verse 11, O Lord, I beseech thee, let now thine ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant and to the prayer of thy servant. So we know that he'll, God will hear us. Who desire to fear thy name and prosper, I pray thee, thy servant this day, and grant him mercy See, we have that mercy today. We don't have to pray for God's mercy. We've learned that through Paul. It's there. It's a marvelous thing. So, but we'll see as we go into these things how, how Paul teaches us to respond to the things. Now go back to chapter 2 of Nehemiah. Go up to chapter 2 of Nehemiah, verse 1. We see here at the last part of verse 1, he says, Now I had not been before time sad in his presence. Well, we mentioned the fact that Nehemiah had a good testimony. And it was important for him, a good, for him to have a good testimony because his boss let him off to go do what he knows he had to do. And, and his boss hadn't seen him like this before. So he knew that it was real. So I, I say there that uh, Nehemiah had a good testimony. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. What about Paul? How important is a good testimony to people? Now, we realize that 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, we realize today as I say that, 
that sometimes you can have a perfectly good biblical testimony and still have a bad testimony to the people because they don't like it. They don't buy it or whatever. They don't believe you. Just like Tobias said, I, I have doubt that you can be this way. But we won't get into that, that aspect of it. We just see in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 8, Paul did have a good testimony. Uh, for when you sounded out the word of the Lord, told people what God had said, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to God where it is spread abroad, so that we need not to speak anything. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. So they had, Paul's people had a good testimony. They saw that what Paul was teaching had entered into their lives, and it had changed their lives. That's a good testimony. Look at, look at uh, Philemon chapter 1. Uh, Philemon's only got one chapter, but... Just still say that once in a while. Philemon. Verse 6. This is a really good verse that talks about that the communication of thy faith may become effectual. So we want to tell people, we want to communicate what is it we believe. We want it to be effectual. And it says here, by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. That means our life has changed. People see something different there. They may not like it. Remember in, the, remember in the wall, by the time they were done, they realized that that was the work of God. And people are going to have to look at us in different, different situations in our lives, and they're going to see that, you know, it took you 10 years, but I think you're really serious finally. I mean, you've been going to that church for how many years, and they know that you're serious church people. They know that you don't do certain things and still haven't done it for so, so, many, so many years, and uh, somebody invites you over to do something, and you say, I don't do that. Well, a couple of years later, you want to come over? No, I still don't do that. See, that's, that's, that takes God to get us to stay away from those things, because we won't do it on our own. Somebody hears you say, no, I won't do this, and then three weeks later, you invite them over, or they invite you over, and then you sit down and you watch one of those things, then you've already blown your testimony. It's better to blow a, te it's better to blow a friend than a testimony. Because after a while, you'll have the right kind of friends. So we see that Nehemiah had a good testimony. We see that Paul had a good testimony. And that was important for what Paul had to come up. Now, back to Nehemiah chapter 2. We see here that Nehemiah... Now, I'm going to have to put something in the place of Nehemiah because I'm going to keep looking for this thing all the time here. You're probably the same way, right? I knew there was a purpose for this thing up here. Well, uh, I guess there wasn't a purpose for this thing. Thank you, Bob, for the... Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 12. Now, this is where Nehemiah gets a chance, and he goes back and he looks at the situation up close. Through that 12 through 16, you can read it, you probably already have. But we, we see that Nehemiah was very quiet about it. It was, it was his business and nobody else's business for him to go and see what's going on. He goes at night and this type of a thing and doesn't go yakking about people what he's going to do. Now, now Paul is good with that. Paul, let, let's look at a couple of things. Let's go to 1 Corinthians. Keep your stuff in Nehemiah, though. Let's look at 1 Corinthians as we kind of zip through this tonight. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Are your pages in, in Paul's epistles getting kind of worn? Have you noticed more than the rest? Kind of sticking out further and everything? That's good. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. Paul surveys the situation, and he sees here in the church of Corinth there, he says, I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no denominations, <laughs> be no divisions among you. I'm not, I wouldn't be surprised if that isn't where denominations kind of got started. I mean, everybody had different ideas, different beliefs, said different things. And get enough people together, you can start a church in that little realm. But that, he, he recognized there's a problem. He was concerned about that. Look at Galatians chapter 3. So, so Paul is, took, took a, he, he surveyed the situation. Uh, Galatians chapter 3, verse 1. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you, that ye should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you? This only would I learn of you, received ye by the Spirit, by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith. Are ye so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? So he sees what's going on in that situation. That's not a good situation at all. And he, he surveys and he sees that. Look at Colossians chapter 2, a couple of pages over. These are just a few of them that he sees. Colossians chapter 2, verse 1. 
For I would that ye knew what great conflict I have for you, and for them at Laodicea, and for as many as not seen my face in the flesh, that the hearts might be comforted. Apparently the hearts weren't being comforted. Being knit together in love, apparently they weren't knit together. And unto all riches of the full assurance, they probably had no assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. He was concerned. People weren't getting what they should have been getting. Look at uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Second Thess it's 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3. Serious concerns here. Verse 3, 2 Thessalonians chapter, chapter 1, verse 3. We are bound to thank God always for your brethren, and it is meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you toward each other aboundeth. So that's good. So that we ourselves glory in you and the churches of God for your patience and faith and all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure. Must have been having some hard times still. Which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which ye also suffer. Trying to do something right is going to show people out there what God still says is right. Which is a judgment. Just your appearance shows up as a judgment. Why, why, do, they, why do you think they ask us, are you judging me? When you, when you, when you, that kind of, when you're dressing or the way you talk or whatever you don't do anymore, they think you're judged. I didn't judge you, but your appearance as a Christian, the way God would have us to be, sure, that, that's a token of judgment right there. Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you, and to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus... And then he goes on and he talks about how to be comforted. So, so Paul in his survey realizes that people are getting stressed out, they're getting uncomforted. Look at chapter 3. Chapter 3, verse 6. Now we command you, brethren, in, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition which he received of us. And those are things that Paul has taught. For ye yourselves know how ye ought to follow us, for we behave not ourselves disorderly among you. And then it goes on. Paul realizes in his survey, as he sees the situation, that there's people that are having trouble within their own brethren, family situation, church family, whatever. And he helps them deal with it. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3. There's a lot more verses, there's a lot more places that uh, Paul makes these observations. And we know, we know chapter 3, verses 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. This is the form of godliness the, without natural affection, that whole series. And we see at the very end that he talks about uh, 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 Janus and Jambres, uh, how they fought against Moses, how they withstood Moses. So do these also resist the truth we're talking then in Paul's day, and we're still talking about that today. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. So he sees that, he recognizes that, and he says, listen, their folly is going to be made manifest someday. So uh, he, he tells us today that the challenges that are going on in this modern Christianity, the, the folly is being, being uh, manifested. Unfortunately, those that recognize the folly of it all throw it all out. That's the hard part. That's the sad part. They just figure that all religion, all Christianity, all Bible, the whole thing, I'll just get rid of it all, and I'll just go out there and, and uh, follow this modern Christianity, if, if they even do that. Well, back to Nehemiah chapter 2. So Nehemiah surveys the situation. Paul has done some surveying. He knows what's going on out there. But Paul is looking to the people. Nehemiah is looking towards a city and a wall to protect his people. So back to uh, Nehemiah. Chapter 2, verse 17. We see here that this is where, what, is one of the, what, are the, what is one of the things Nehemiah does? Well, he goes out and he gets people together, and he gets up a crew, and he gets his people who are going to fix this wall. Uh, verse 17, he says, uh, Then I said unto them, Ye see the distress that we are in? Oh, yes, Nehemiah, we see that. How, how Jerusalem lieth waste? Oh, yeah, this is terrible. And the gates thereof are burned with fire? Come, and let us build up the wall of Jerusalem, that we be no more a reproach. So, so he gets them their strength, he strengthened, their, strengthened their, their hands are strengthened. It's a good work they're going to do. And look at Romans chapter 16. Paul really didn't do this thing on his own. He wasn't some little guy, a uh, guy with bad eyes or whatever people say that he is or was, uh, walking around all by his little lonesome teaching this stuff. He had a group, he had a bunch of people that were there with him. And you go through Romans 16, one place, there's other places, but uh, Romans 16, you've got um, 
uh, Epinetus, you've got Mary, you've got Andronoticus, you've got Junia, you've got Amplius, Urbane, Apalus, uh, Herodian, and you've got a whole bunch of names in there. So, so Paul had to have his encouragement. He had to have his, his, his people be there with him too. And they had to be willing to uh, do the, the life that Paul was preaching, be an example. So we see that in Romans chapter 16, a, a lot of Rufus down there in 13. Have no idea what these people did. Some of them we do, but most of them we don't. Isn't there one in there, uh, let's see where they're listed here. Uh, uh, verse 3, Pris Priscilla and Aquila. Who, who did they get a hold of? Apollos. And uh, Apollos is the one where we get to the fact that they're learning the way of God more perfectly. Still the way of God, it's just there's more to it. There's more finished, there's more perfectly. And that's because of them right there. And they had a home church too. So by the way, we have home church movement in America that's really, really terrible. See, they got the right idea. Something's wrong. But they still don't come up with the right solution, which is really too bad. Okay, so now let's go back to Nehemiah. Yep, I took my marker out of Nehemiah. That was brilliant. Okay. Nehemiah uh, chapter 2. So along comes the enemy. Along comes the challenge. Along comes all the things that Paul has seen. And uh, verse 20. And he says here in verse 20, then answered I them, and said unto them, These are the sand ballot, and all these people that uh, were grieved at him exceedingly. The God of heaven, he will prosper us. Therefore we his servants will arise and build. But ye have no portion, nor right, nor memorial in Jerusalem. A city again. But now right away if we see the word build, and we think of Paul, do you know where to go? 1 Corinthians chapter 3. He is our master builder. So when we realize there's something, something i got to deal with, then we go to Paul. We're going to Jesus Christ, we're going to the risen Christ, but we go to his teachings through, through Paul. And, uh, and when we do that, we have to have the same thing that Nehemiah had. He trusted God. He said, God will prosper us. Well, we know that God will prosper us in a kingdom of God situation, not in a kingdom of heaven, not in a physical kingdom. We still could lose this place. I mean, this is just a building. But we still can exist as a Christian. We can still learn and grow, read our Bibles, and we can meet in homes, we can meet in the park, we could... If it ever gets to that point, we can meet over the internet. Of course, they'll have that shut down here pretty soon. and They're just going after this stuff. But you still got a Bible. Even if it gets that bad, you've just got a Bible. So, Nehemiah had trust and faith, and Paul preaches trusting and faith in Christ. It's just that he's not going to prosper us physically. He's going to prosper us spiritual blessings. And there's all these, all these verses for that. I think you know these things. Uh, um, Paul talks about the fact that we can have a knowledge. We have a Bible. Paul talks about the fact that we can have an understanding, an assurance of understanding, the riches of an assurance of understanding, to actually understand what's going on. We can get that. God will give us that. And you'll see as we go through this thing, which we're kind of zipping through this tonight, that every one of these things that, that Nehemiah responded with how Paul then shows us how to respond, it's all always going back to this Bible. When, when Nehemiah responds the way he does, and goes to God and comes up with these things that he should do, this is what Paul says to do. You go to his word and you find out what it is that Paul, in his example to us, in sample, would be to follow Paul. It's always to the Bible because he tells us to go to God. Go to the Lord. We go to the Lord in prayer? Sure. But how do you hear back from him? Bible. And that's what we'll see tonight. Let's go here to uh, chapter 4, verse 4. Here's something else that Nehemiah does, depending upon the situation there. He goes to prayer. He's been hassled by his enemy as such. And he says, Hear, o, o our God, for we are despised. Or if we were to sing it, we would say what? We are, we are despised. You have to get that rhythm in the, the syllables. And turn their reproach upon their own head. And give them a prey, give them for a prey in the land of captivity. And cover not their iniquity, and let not their sin be blotted out from before thee. For they have provoked thee to anger before the builders. Wow, that's pretty rough. I don't, I don't think Paul would do that. I don't think the risen Savior is like that. Let's look at 2 Timothy chapter 3. I mean, Nehemiah is asking God to take care of them and give them what they deserve. He doesn't say, well, Lord, should I let them in? We'll, we'll, we'll let them help us build our wall. Maybe we can teach them some things in the process. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Again, it goes back to Janus and Jambres that uh, they resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds are reprobate concerning the faith. Uh, their, their doctrine is going to be uh, 
uh, made, made manifest. God's going let to let the world see that that's a lie. Let's go out there and fix it. God says, I'm going to let them just go on their merry. Has God ever stepped in the way of things? Look how many years it took us to learn, learn some things. God could have stepped. He didn't. He just let us get a hold of this book. And through the preaching and the teaching and the reading and the study, we got to see these things. And so uh, he's, he's just letting them go on. Look at, uh, look at Titus chapter 4. I'm sorry, it's not this uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4. It's above the word Titus. I just, sometimes I read the titles backwards. I get the top of the page, Titus. Ah, this is Titus. No, it's not. But oh well. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 14. Here's this Alexander the coppersmith. Did, him, did Paul much evil? The Lord reward him according to his works. Boy, that doesn't sound very loving. He's hurt me. Lord, he's yours. Reward him according to his works. He has greatly withstood our words. He's against this book, Lord. He's against what we're trying to teach and preach. There are sometimes Paul's pretty hard. Then uh, look at uh, 1 Timothy, I hope it's 1 Timothy, it's probably 1 Romans or something. But let's try 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 19. Chapter 1, verse 19. So Nehemiah says, Lord, give them what they deserve. And there are times Paul says the same thing. This is what they want, then let them have it, Lord. Verse 19, holding, there are these people that holding faith and a good conscience, which some have put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck. Their lives are a mess. Just an absolute disaster. And he gives an example of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan. You want, you, this is what you want? There you are. There's the God of this world. You want the world. You're learning from head book and all that stuff. This is what you want? Go for it. That they may learn not to blaspheme. And that's a hard lesson to learn. And, and you notice it says delivered unto Satan. And don't forget that when somebody goes out into this world, God's not going to whip on them and chastise them and spank them. The devil's going to get them. So that's what happens. When, but Paul let him go. He said, hey, I delivered them unto Satan, he said. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5. So, is uh, Nehemiah, is he wrong in praying that way? No, not at all. Matter of fact, even Paul prays that way for certain situations, for certain people. You want, they want the world? Have it. Demas, there you are. There's the world. Go for it. So we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 5, here's someone who's having fornication with his mother. And in verse 5, deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. And there's all sorts of teachings, and that's pretty rough stuff. So, yeah, that's something that so, does sometimes take place in our lives, that we have to say, go. I'm going, you're going. That's tough. Let's go back to Nehemiah. And I keep taking my marker out of Nehemiah as I talk up here and move my hands. That's really getting irritating. Maybe I'll try, I'll try this. Okay, Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 6. Well, Nehemiah, one of the ways he responds to what he's being challenged here, he says, it says there, So built we the wall. And the wall was joined together into the half thereof, for the people had a mind to work. And Paul says, and look at uh, Colossians chapter 4. Here we go, back. I keep your marker in Nehemiah. Here we go. It's a marvelous, fun book to go through, isn't it? Colossians, cha check my Nehemiah, the pencil's there, okay. Colossians chapter 4. He says in verse 5, walk in wisdom toward them that are without. Then he says, redeeming the time. We're running out of time. And Nehemiah says, we, gotta, we have to have a mind to work. We've got to get going. And he keeps them busy. We have to keep busy. Redeeming our time. Just, just go home and, and think how much time you waste on something. Redeem the time. Could that have been a time you could have done your quiz again because you botched it so bad the first time? Or whatever. Is this a time maybe you could uh, look at something that's interesting or, or not just put in your devotion, but something that you're interested in? If you haven't got an interest, maybe you should do some reading to find something that would be interesting. Or something for somebody else. Or just get caught up in the past so your future can be a little bit smoother. Whatever. Uh, we're, we're pretty good time wasters. And Nehemiah, was, well, let's go build a wall. Let's go do it. Okay. Okay, let's go to verse 9 of Nehemiah. 
Is it still there? It's still there. Nehemiah chapter five, 4, verse 9. Well, here we are again. Well, how does Nehemiah respond? Well, nevertheless, we made our prayer unto God. And set a watch against them day and night because of them. So, what does he He stays close to God. Paul tells us to pray without ceasing. He tells us to read and study, rightly divide, that type of thing. So we do that. We know that Paul says in Romans 7 that he battles the mind and the flesh all the time. So there's always, it's, all, it's an all the time, 24-7 thing. So he's got to stay tight. He's got, he talks about the armor of God in Ephesians chapter 6. There's how you watch. That's what he's setting up here. Um, look at 2 Timothy chapter, th chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. You know, I know this is fast, but I just want you to see that we can still get an example out of Nehemiah, but we can't conflict against Paul. Second, uh, first, Second Timothy chapter one verse thirteen. Hold fast to form of sound words. That's like setting a watch day and night. You you know what's coming. Never never let our guard down. Isn't that nice that the Lord never takes His armor down? We can we can't even take it down ourselves, but we seem to uh, let it let it penetrate sometimes. I guess that's just a figure of speech away preaching that thing. It says up there in verse 3, he tells us to, in uh, chapter 2, verse 3, he tells us to endure hardness. It's going to come. So prepare for it. Watch and pray. Uh, watch day and night. It, it's there. You, st you, stay strong at, you stay strong at work during the day. Don't forget to stay strong at night. All the time. If you go through the, uh, the whole thing there about Nehemiah in chapter 4, 9 all the way down, he's got them carrying their weapon with him everywhere they go. What's their weapon? What's our weapon? It's a two, sharper than a two-edged sword. Our Bible should be, with, be, should be with us all the time. Have you ever been in a situation where I don't need my, I won't, I know I won't need my Bible here. And then that's where you needed your Bible. That, that's a frustrating time. And then you carry your Bible everywhere you go and you don't need it. Well, hey, it's okay. I'd hate to be someplace, I'd hate to be in Costco and some nutcase goes into Costco and I've always had my gun in Costco and then the one day I don't have it, everybody's held hostage. Going, oh, wait, wait, can I go out to the car just a minute? Let me go out to my car. I left my purse out in the car. Kind of, no, they won't let you do that. So we have to be prepared all the time. Anyway, right, let's go back to Nehemiah. If you're not already still there, Nehemiah 4.10. This is where they recognize the fact that their life is full of rubbish. Their, 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 their rubbish is keeping them from fixing that wall. Did you see in the news the other day where a man died in his house? because of the rubbish in his house. Anybody see that? He had so much rubbish in his house that he had tunnels to the ceiling. You think your rooms are messy? Yeah. This guy had, had garbage in his house for years and he had tunnels through the garbage. Mm -hmm. And then one of the tunnels, an older guy, one of the tunnels collapsed on him and he died. He, he, uh, de they said he de dehydrated, he couldn't get out. That's rubbish. Isn't that rubbish? That's, that's terrible. But don't use that as your example, girls, I mean. Dad, you don't, don't say, Dad, I haven't got, I, I don't have to build tunnels yet. Okay, good, don't go there, don't go there. So, uh, ne, uh, th this, is a, this is a situation that's, uh, uh, the bear that says there, the strength of the bears of burdens is decayed in verse 10. It was, it's hard, and there's much rubbish. We can't even build the wall. Well, look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3. You know, they, they get rid of that stuff. In fact, while there's so much rubbish there, this is where the enemy creeps in and gets to be part of them, mixes in amongst them. I would imagine that guy's garbage probably had a couple good things in there somewhere. I'm not sure, you know. And, you know, and it was weird because you see the picture of this guy's house and there was garbage coming out the windows. You don't think maybe somebody should have said something maybe? Just nosy neighbors. Well, man, you got garbage coming out of your windows and it's higher than your window. And nobody cared, I guess. I don't know. It's hard to say anymore. You know, in California, you can get sued now for helping somebody. That Good Samaritan law is no longer in existence in California. So if Jimmy sees somebody going to burn to death and he's going to run in there and save him, I, I, would, I would hesitate thinking, you know what, if I don't get this guy out totally, I could get in trouble for this. That's, that's what California is, back to that thing again. Anyway, 2 Corinthians 13, talking about rubbish, 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5. What I, is what I say? Well, don't pay attention to me. Yeah, I know you do. You do very good at that. 
Speaking of rubbish, <laughs> 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5. I got to go back and listen to that. I didn't. I said, what, 30? Three. Oh, three. Oh, okay. I can, I can fake out a three. That's normal. Okay. <laughs> Chapter 30 is a rough one to explain that one. Which 30 is just three backwards. That's all that would have been. You know. He says, examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not in your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobates. I mean, you don't, you don't know this? Are you or are you not? But I trust that you shall know that we are not reprobates and uh, that kind of a thing. I like this. Now I pray to God that ye do no evil, not that we should appear approved. You know, you're looking good as a Christian. But uh, that we should do that which is honest. Though we be as reprobates, I mean, our flesh is still flesh. So Paul does tell us to dig, dig into that rubbish and see if we can't get rid of some of that stuff. He talks about the snare of the devil that people are caught in. That's rubbish. He talks about the, uh, the Word of God, which will correct us and instruct us in righteousness. That will show us the rubbish and then show us how to get out of that. Get the rubbish out of there or whatever. whatever. So well, there's that. Let's go back to Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 13. Nehemiah is being challenged by Tobiah and Sanballat and these guys again. And they're getting more people involved. You see in verse 13. He says, Therefore set I in the lower places behind the wall, and on the higher places I even set the people after their families with their swords and their spears and their bows. So Nehemiah gets out there, and he's down at the bottom where it really counts, and yet he's still got the families up there, uh, and they're still watching. They're still taken care of. This is where they get their weapons and everything, uh, in, their, in, their, in one hand and their shovel in the other kind of a thing. And what does Paul tell us to do? He tells us in Philippians chapter 1, for example, one of the many places, what does he tell us to do? Philippians chapter 1. He says in chapter 1, verse 9, In this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment, that you may approve things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. What is, that, what is he saying there? He's saying just like Nehemiah. Nehemiah says in verse 14, And I looked and rose up and said unto the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, Be not afraid of them, be not ye afraid of them. Remember the Lord, which is great and terrible, and fight for your brethren, your sons and your daughters your wives, and your houses. So he challenges them to get up there and fight. What's our fight? Our fight is a spiritual fight. Mind against flesh. And he says that thing in, in Philippians there about, listen, teach your sons, teach your daughters, teach your family, teach for, for the sake of even keeping the church going here. Let's make sure that we grow in judgment. Let's, let's learn what things are excellent. Let's, let's make those decisions that we need to make. That's how you fight. You just stop doing something or start doing something based on whatever it is that you learn to do. So, see, Paul doesn't, Paul doesn't do things differently than Nehemiah. The, the plan is still there. It's just that it's a spiritual war, not a physical one that Nehemiah had to deal with. What, is, what does Paul even say in, in uh, Ephesians chapter 6? He talks about not flesh and blood, but principalities. It's, it's, a, it's a spiritual war. Spiritual warfare, we use physical people, physical things, physical places to drag us down, cause us to stumble, cause us to have a power over us that's wrong. But, uh, you know, as far as our soul is concerned, that's, that's taken care of. But there's a testimony involved. It's getting other people, you know, we could cause somebody else to stumble on physical things that could actually keep them from getting the right Jesus. I mean, there's so much at stake here when people see what it is that we, that we, that we uh, do as a Christian. Look at, uh, look at uh, uh, Nehemiah chapter 5. We're just going through this quickly. I suppose you can tell that already. I just want you to see that uh, there's something there for both of them. The notes are online if you want to follow that. Um, who's there tonight, Sam, still? Okay. Um, Nehemiah chapter 5, verse 6. And I was very angry when I heard their cry in these words. And this is where they were, uh, they were being burdened and bondaged down with things here. Uh, and he says, Then I consulted with myself. That's meditate. You think about things. You don't go by your opinion, but you still think about things. And I rebuked the nobles and the rulers and said unto them, Ye exact usury, every one of his brother. And I set a great assembly against him. And I said unto them, We after our ability have redeemed our brethren, the Jews, which were sold unto the heathen. And will ye even sell your brethren? 
or shall they be sold unto us? Then held they their peace and found nothing to answer. So Nehemiah put it to the people who were putting that on those folks. And in the process, he talks about what it would take to build that wall. You get down into verse 14 through 19, he talks about a sacrifice, that he was never received any government uh, um, uh, bread from the king and all that sort of a thing. And, and what I see here is, is, is uh, Nehemiah setting an example. And it's a sacrificial example. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11 for Paul. What does Paul do? Nehemiah didn't go to work. He didn't get any pay. And he did what he had to do. 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, what is this? Verse 16. I say again, let no man think me a fool. If otherwise, yet as a fool receive me, that I may boast myself a little. That which I speak, I speak it not after the Lord, but as it were foolishly, in this confidence of boasting. Seeing that many glory after the flesh, I will glory also. For ye suffer fools gladly, seeing ye yourselves are wise. For see, if ye suffer, if a man bring you into bondage, if a man devour you, if a man take of you, if a man exalt himself, if a man smite you on the face. I speak as concerning reproach, as though we had been weak. Howbeit, wherein soever in is bold, I speak foolishly. He's, he's reminding us, I speak foolishly. I am bold also. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of David? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool still. He's being sarcastic here. I am more. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths oft. Of the Jews five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice I was beaten, was I beaten with rods, once I was, st was I stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck. And night, a night and day I have been in the deep, in journeyings often, in perils of waters. And so if, if you want to complain, Paul says, if you want to say how hard this is for you, let me tell you what I've been through. That's what he's saying. Now, Nehemiah was telling these people, all the sacrifice that you've done, and, he, and he, he fixes that for them, but he does remind them that I have sacrificed as well, not in a prideful manner, just like Paul. Look at, Philipp, look at uh, Philippians. Philippians chapter 1, verse 20. There was sacrifice involved here. Philippians chapter 1, verse 20. According to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by the life or by death. He was hoping for death, actually. Because he says, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, meaning he's alive, uh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I wot not. For I'm in a straight, twi straight betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. I would imagine there's been folks that have been in that situation where, you know, I'm just, I just hope I can die. I'd much rather be with the Lord. He says, nevertheless, I mean, he, he could have gone to be with the Lord. He's been with the Lord, actually. He says, but nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you, you all, there you go, Sue, you all for your furtherance and joy of faith that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again. That's what Paul's request. That's very sacrificial. So, Nehemiah was sacrificing, so was Paul. What did it take for us to have this Bible? Look at all the sacrifice that went by. And that's a tremendous amount of sacrifice for, for us to have this Bible today. What kind of sacrifice has been made to even keep this place going so we can still be here? What kind of sacrifice will it take? What kind of sacrifice will you do, Pastor? What kind of sacrifice will you do, folks? I mean, we'll see what's coming. Nehemiah was an example. So was Paul. Look at uh, Philippians chapter... Let's go back to Nehemiah chapter... No, let's go here down to... Um, let's go to Philippians chapter 4. Got one more here, I think. Yes, one more. For Paul. Sacrificial. Philippians chapter 4, verse 15. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel... I say that right? Philippians, okay. <laughs> I don't need to bring up the 
you know. <laughs> okay, just, I don't know, something didn't seem right. That in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. For even in Thessalonica, ye sent once and again unto my necessity. Paul had needs, and they were filled. Not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. What a, what a sacrificial attitude he had there. But I have, I have all, and abound. I am full, having received of Ephroditus, the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice, acceptable, well-pleasing to God. We're not even really having a sacrifice yet. I mean, I got 10,000 rounds in my office. No need to worry about that. I've got probably 10,000 pieces of chocolate in there too somewhere. We're, we're doing fine, you know. When will the sacrifice take place? We really haven't had to sacrifice much. I'm not looking forward to that part. Paul's our example, as was Nehemiah to his people. In, in fact, let me think here, where's this at? That's, uh, look at Philippians chapter 1. Now we're just about done here, kids. Philippians chapter, there's another example I just think in this here. The hard times, it's in Philippians chapter 1, uh, verse 12. But I would ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather into the furtherance of the gospel. Okay, so we have some challenges here. We have something horrible that takes place. The gospel can still be furthered. It can still be taken care of, so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. And many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. So something drastically happens to me or to this church or somebody in here. It's an, an attack or whatever it is. We should, we should just rise to the occasion and we'll still be stronger. That's what a sacrificial thing will take place. Should take place, seeing something like that. Okay, back to Nehemiah chapter 6. Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 3. And I sent messengers unto them. This is when he was uh, asked to, to come get involved, you know, that kind of a thing. Um, and I sent messengers unto them, saying, I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down why should the work cease, whilst I leave it and come down to you? Yet they sent unto me four times after this sort, and I answered them after the same manner. And then he gets a fifth one as well there. And so uh, Nehemiah was very good at saying no. No. And what does Paul say? Paul says, well, listen, we need to pray. We'll have tears. We'll be concerned. We need to have grace. We need to have mercy. We need to have long-suffering. We need to have patience. But there comes a time where I've got to change my voice because I, I have, I'm in doubt of you. There comes a time where he says we need to reprove, we need to rebuke. Nobody likes to hear that. In order to be reproved or rebuked, you've got to be on their inside wall or they're going to block you out. Then he says the hard stuff. Avoid. Withdraw. Not strive. Not give heed. Purge. Reject. Mark cast off, have no fellowship with, be not partakers of, have no company with. And then the worst of all, off to Satan. That's a pretty good no. So yes, there comes a time. Nehemiah, I suppose, could have let those people come in. He could have gone over and visited with them and talked this thing through. I would imagine there were people in Nehemiah's congregation that were saying, Nehemiah, why don't you go talk to these guys? They're giving us such a hard time. Why don't you just go talk to them and maybe you can, maybe you can help them. Nehemiah said, no, we're busy. We've got something going here, and I'm not going to take the time. I've got something going here. Paul says the same thing. Eventually, we have to say no. Nehemiah chapter 6 again, verse 11. Now we've got this traitor guy that shows up, so how does Nehemiah handle that? Same thing. He avoids him, turns him away, won't have company with him. At all. So the same thing pops in again. Matter of fact, if there's anything we can get from Paul, as well as the law and, and how Christ take, took care of the law and the law is not there for righteousness, that kind of a thing, it's the fact that very, Paul is very adamant about, yes, this is the dispensation of grace and this is the time to have grace and mercy, but he says, if it's going to cause you damage, you get out of there. Paul's very strong about that. 
Then we go to chapter 6, verse 15 and 16. So the wall was finished. But it just seems like the enemy isn't. Never has been. Again, what does Paul say? Mercy, grace. Maybe they'll see it in three years. Maybe the little seed that you planted, as they got mad at you and you an answered with a soft answer, maybe that little answer, that little seed that you planted, uh, will work. Remember the guy that told me that we should be following Paul? And we laughed. It was 25, it was a long time ago, years back in New York. Whoever said that to Cliff doesn't know what's come out of that little comment that 20, 30 years, is it really that long? 20, 30 years in New York? What is that only? 13 here and 6 or 9? Whew. 19, yeah, wow. <laughs> 20 years ago or thereabouts, and then now it's taking place. So we don't know that. So, yes, we're finished. We got our job done, but they're going to keep, we're going to keep hassling us. We know that. But Paul says mercy, patience, long suffering. But Paul is also very clear that we need to say no eventually. If it's starting to drag you down or harm you or harm the wall that you've built, or the testimony that you developed, you can't let them get it. But just remember, they will never give up. And they won't give up today. They're still after Paul. You know, there's websites out there. There's uh, there's right there's uh, pal talk people that men that go around on the on the internet thing looking for pal talk Paul people, and uh, we haven't seen any more probably. But uh, they go after this. My job's my ministry. Got to show you guys how wrong you are, kind of a thing. So they still hate Paul's teachings. They still hate the King James Bible, and they hate anything that's right. They hate the right music. They hate you dressing right, talking right, acting right. They hate all that stuff. They always will. Anyway, amen. There you go.